So this morning I am continuing with, and I'm completing actually, our Praying with Purpose series. I hope you've been following along and catching up if you've missed out on some of the um, the messages. And I'm going to be teaching today on Praying with Purpose for Media and Communication, Arts, Entertainment and Sport. So it's quite a lot, but um, you'll see we'll, we'll go through it with ease. We'll cut through it with, like butter, okay? <laughs> And, um, yeah, I think my heart in all of this is that we raise up an army of praying people within our church. I would love us all to be prayerful people in prayer, not only for my family and the things that concern me, but to pray concerning the things that are on God's heart. And the things that are on God's heart are nations. It's nations and peoples and these, all of these domains. And so I don't only want to just equip us with an idea of a, a kind of sketch of a biblical worldview of these domains, but I'm wanting to equip us with an idea and a biblical sketch of worldviews of these domains that we may pray intelligently. That when we pray, we pray according to the mind and the heart of God. Amen. Because it's no point me coming to prayer and we praying and we're praying things that are not in accordance with God's heart and with how he sees things. Because if I don't pray in accordance with God's mind and his will and his heart, my prayers are not going to be answered. And I don't know about you, but I want to pray more effectively. When I come to pray, I want to have an idea that this is God's will. This is God's heart. And as I pray this, I know that it's making a difference. I know that he's going to answer this prayer. Yes, it might be a matter of time. It might be a matter of time until that bowl in heaven is filled with incense and the answer is poured out. But I want to pray prayers that are effective. And I want to pray prayers that will get an answer from God. Amen. Okay, I'm sure you're with me on that. So I'm going to start off with looking at media and communication. And I'll move on through the rest um, a bit later once we've touched on this. But Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You're the teacher you're the one who really gives us your burden for nations, your burden for these domains. And we welcome you into this place. We ask that you would touch our hearts, you would speak to our hearts, you would equip us today to pray more effectively, to pray with intelligence, and to carry your burden. We ask that you would take us to the next level of pray, uh, prayer, Lord God, individually and corporately. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if I look at media and communication, how many of you have ever thought about praying for the media and communication? Okay, it doesn't necessarily pop up as top of our prayer list automatically, but it's an area that God wants us to pray into, and it's an important area for us to pray into, and I'm going to show you why. And I've got a number of very powerful quotes in my message, and I'm actually going to read them. So as I read them to you, they're powerful. That's why I'm reading. That's why I'm not paraphrasing. So please don't check out as I read these quotes to you. Will you, will you say, I'm not going to check out when you read your quotes to me? You're not going to check out, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so Winston Churchill said, the most valuable thing in the world is truth. He also said, in wartime, truth is so precious that she, she will always be attended to or protected by a bodyguard of lies. Andrei Sakharov, who gave the Soviets the atomic bomb, he said this, the most powerful weapon in the world is truth. And he gave, he gave the Soviets the atomic bomb. The most powerful weapon in the world is truth. Ravi Zacharias a current uh, a Christian apologist, he said, the greatest and most notable casualty of our times in which we are inundated with spiritual terminology is unquestionably truth. That is sad. The greatest and most notable casualty of our times in which we are inundated with spiritual terminology is unquestionably truth. You see, the media and communication domain is about truth. It's about communication of truth. And God desires truth, and he desires truth and love together. The New King James Version in Proverbs 3, verse 3 to 4, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your heart. 
Bind them around your neck. Write them on your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. In the Passion Translation, it says, Hold on to loyal love and don't let go. Be faithful to all you've been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity. Let with truth written upon your heart. You see, God desires truth and he desires love at the same time. Truth and love. Amen. And the reason why I think God desires love in there is truth on its own can sometimes be quite cutting. It can sometimes be destructive if it's not used appropriately. So God puts love in there. And I, I remember watching this documentary where um, they were interviewing this particular theologian who'd done his PhD on spiritual warfare. And his conclusion after he did his PhD and he had studied all these different um, weapons of war and armor, spiritual armor and everything, his conclusion in terms of the most powerful weapon in the world, he said his conclusion is that it is love. Isn't that amazing? And he said, love, because what was the weapon that won the ultimate victory? It was love. It was when Christ laid down his life for you and I that we can enter into salvation and redemption and, and everything that his death and resurrection brought. So love is powerful, but truth is powerful too, and we need truth and love. And you see, this domain of media and communication is about truth being presented to people so that people can make informed decisions. Deuteronomy 13 verse 12 to 14 says, If you hear someone in one of your cities which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their sitting city, saying, Let's go and serve other gods which you have not known. So basically, if stuff happens that you're not happy with, then it says you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. Inquire, search out, and ask diligently. Deuteronomy 11.20 says, And you shall write them, the words of the Lord, on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. You see, there's something about truth and building our lives and our homes on truth and around truth and seeking out and searching out and diligently inquiring concerning truth. There's something about that that results in our days and the days of our children being prolonged in the promises and the promised land that God has given us. Okay. And God says, I'm going to read it a bit later, but God says, I set today before you life and death. Choose life. And that is what this domain is about. It's about presenting the truth before people that they can make informed decisions. Okay. Um, and media in particular has such a great influence on our lives today. I've got a few quotes here. Which are, which are powerful. Dr. Peter Horsfield, who's a minister who works, who's currently working on electronic culture research projects. Um, and he says the world that has one of the greatest impacts on our decision making, value formation, relationships, and self perception is the technologically mediated world. So true. The world that has the domain that has one of the greatest impacts on our decision making, value formation, relationships, and self-perception is the technologically mediated world. Just reflect on yourself. Reflect on your kids. How much time do we spend on Facebook? How much time do we spend looking at other people's stuff that they put on social media? How much time do we spend watching movies that end up shaping our worldview, that end up shaping our value formation, our kids' value formation? Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a, a journalist, and he lived from 1903 to 1990, so he penned this a bit before this. all of the social media and internet was so prevalent, um, but, but he saw it coming, and he said, the media in general are incomparably the greatest single influence in our society today, exerted at all social, economic, and cultural levels. The influence, influence, I should add, is, in my opinion, largely exerted irresponsibly, arbitrarily, and without reference to any moral, intellectual, still less spiritual guidelines whatsoever. And that is true, isn't it? That is true. One wonders what he would say today with all the advances in technology and social media. How much more is the media the single greatest influence on our society 
And we need to pray into media. We need to pray that God will raise up Christians with a biblical worldview in the media domain. Amen. Okay, so that is a bit of what media domain is, is, is about. And the name and nature and attributes of God that he desires are manifest in this domain. Because remember, in each of these domains, there's an aspect of God that he desires is manifest through this domain. And, and as, as I'm sure you can guess, the name, nature, and attributes of God to be manifested in and through this domain are living word and truth. Living word and truth. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 16 verse 13 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And this is the scripture I was thinking about earlier, Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20. I call heaven and witnesses against you, uh, heaven and earth as witnesses against you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your dependents may live, that you may love the Lord your God and obey his voice, may cling to him, and you may live long in the land that he's given to you and your, um, children. So, it's important that we desire truth. That is who God is. We desire his living word. We desire to be the living word and the truth to those around us with love, right? Okay. Um, and the lie that God's this truth today, I think, remember what Winston Churchill said, that often the truth is guarded by a bodyguard of lies. The lie that God's this truth today, I think, in our current culture is that there are no absolutes. People like to espouse that. People like to say that, yeah, but there are no absolutes. Everyone must just do what they feel is right in their own eyes. So I can move in with my girlfriend because I must just do what I feel is right and it's okay and you mustn't judge me. I can do whatever I feel is good to do. But if we take that idea to the nth degree, it means that if there are no absolutes, there's no such thing as murder. There's no such thing as those type of wrongs. There have to be some form of absolutes. And the statement itself invalidates itself. Because if I say there are no absolutes, well, that's an absolute, isn't it? So it's invalidated by itself. <laughs> okay. So there have to be absolutes and there have to be truths. And I know people are on a journey. Everyone is on a journey and we have to allow people to come to the place where they recognize that God is God. But at the same time, we have to know in our hearts that there's truth and they are absolutely absolutes. Amen. Okay. So the purpose, one of the primary purposes of this domain is to provide truthful, objective information to the, impo of importance to the community. So citizens can make informed, responsible decisions. Okay. One of the primary purposes is to provide truthful, objective information of importance to the community. So we can make informed and responsible decisions. And the media also has a really powerful role to play in holding to account those with influential positions. For example, those in government, those who've been given responsibility over the nation. The media is to actually hold them to account. That is an important role, truth. That is an important role that the media is meant to do. Okay? Even those in business those in influential spheres, even those in church, leaders in church, leaders of any capacity. The media is meant to hold people to account, and it's important that it does that, but it can only do that if it's, tra if it's trafficking in truth. Amen. Okay, so some important factors for us to bear in mind is those who consume media. Um, it's critical that we bear in mind that when we read a story, when I hear a story on the news, etc., remember it's only one side of the story. It's only one side of the story. It's some of the story. It's not the whole story. And media is often, stories are often written in a certain way to hook you emotionally. Okay? But we always have to bear in mind it's one side of the story. And I know when I watch, sometimes when I watch carte blanche, I like to watch carte blanche and then have a burden to pray for certain things. But I have to always remember, you know what? These guys are putting forward one side of the story. Even as pastors, when we have, say my husband is doing marriage, we're doing marriage counseling, and we have a wife come forward and explain one side of the story. It's easy, especially for me as a woman. I can pick up her fence. I can, I can take on her side. I can be sure. What is that man doing? You know? But I always have to remember 
that it's only one side of the story and we have to bear that in mind when we read and we consume media. Proverbs 18, 17 says, the first one to plead his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him. The second important thing for us to remember, especially as prayerful people and intercessors when we're wanting to engage and pray for the media, is that there's truth that is important for us to be aware of, but there's also truth that defiles and negatively impacts me. Okay, so some truth, like my husband, for instance, he, when he's counseling some people, he won't tell me the details if it's going to negatively impact me. If someone, there's certain things that I can benefit from knowing we can pray for together. There's some things that that don't benefit me if I know it. Amen. We need to be careful what truth we share with each other. And it's important we are aware of it and have strong boundaries to protect ourselves. When I was away in in Natal recently, um, when we were... We were sitting, there was a group of friends, and I have a spirit-filled believer who's a friend of mine. She's not a part of this assembly, and she was sharing something that she'd read and that a relative of hers had written. And he'd written it in a book, and it had really happened to him. And we were sitting there, and she was explaining things that he'd gone through as a child, and it had really happened to him. And he'd gone to court as a result of it, and his whole life had been had been kind of gone off the rails as a result of something that he'd experienced as a child. And she was talking about, and she started to go into details about things that happened to him at boys' school. It was stuff to do with sexual stuff. And I just said to her, I'm sorry, I can't. I could feel myself getting defiled as she was going into all the graphic details of the sexual stuff that had happened to him. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't actually stay here. And I got up to walk away. And she said, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I said, I just can't because I feel defiled. And she said, it's fine, I won't, I won't say anything more. So I think we have to set our boundaries. There's some things that are upbuilding for us to hear and take in as truth. And there's some things that aren't. Even when we're watching things like carte blanche, when we're watching things that are true, we have to say to ourselves, is this defiling me? Do I, do I walk away and feel defiled? Am I going to have images in my mind that I'm going to have to deal with with the next week? You know, because they feel, I feel heavy and I feel depressed. We have to make sure that what we consume is upbuilding. Because Philippians 4 verse 8 to 9 says, Whatever things are true and noble and just, whatever things are pure and lovely and of good report, if there's anything virtuous, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. See, sometimes I think we don't have peace because all of the stuff we allow in through our ear gates, our eye gates, and into our hearts. I was doing a trainer set yesterday, three hours long on my trainer, which is quite long. And I thought, okay, let me watch a movie. I need to do something. So I put this movie on, and and I quite like fast move, fast moving movies. You know, I don't like slow. <laughs> and the problem with those is very often they're violent. Or sometimes they've got bad language. And there's so many times I've actually just had to switch it off because in the first five minutes, there's a swear word. Or in the first five minutes, there's so much blood and gore. I actually know it's not good for me. And that's what happened. I had to switch it off. And I'm on a journey in terms of this Philippians 4 verse 8 to 9. Even my kids, they're on a journey. Like they love to play these computer games. And I keep saying to them, guys, I keep saying to my husband, you know what? The Bible says whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report... Like, are some of these computer games and some of these movies that we watch, is that, is, 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 does it weigh up to that? Because that is the Bible standard. And if we're wanting to have peace in our hearts and we're wanting to walk without a lot of baggage to deal with, we have to, we have to use the Bible standard. Amen. I'm not wanting to put a religious thing on you. I'm expressing what I, a journey that I'm on and just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and Him just saying to me, no, turn it off. It's not upbuilding. You know, he he said that to me yesterday. So I think this is such a powerful scripture, Philippians 4, verse 8 to 9, for us to bear in mind and pray concerning media, concerning TV, concerning the movies that are produced, concerning the adverts that are produced, concerning what we see in magazines, and to pray concerning people who are involved in the media domain. Okay, so I have some prayer points here, and I'm going to pray through them because the main purpose of this series is I'm wanting to equip us to pray for the domains. So I'm going to pray, and you're going to agree with me, aren't you? Okay, and then you're going to take these prayer points, and you're going to use them at home, aren't you? Amen. Okay. 
Okay, so Father, today we come before you as your church and Lord, we cry out to, we cry out for mercy, Lord, where we, where we haven't been clear around boundaries, um, in our own lives and in our own homes where we've allowed language and profanity and violence into our own living rooms, Lord, on TV or via the internet that we would never let in our home through any other means, Lord. We pray for mercy. We ask that you would give us wisdom as your people to know what to let into our homes, to know what to let into our minds and to our hearts, through our ears, through our eyes, Lord God. What to engage with even if we play computer games for those who do what, how to raise up our kids, Lord God, in terms of what they allow in their minds and their hearts at such a young age. We pray for mercy and wisdom. And Father, today we thank you for writers and producers. We thank you for broadcasters and journalists working in the media. We thank you for the abilities. We thank you for their skills. Lord, we pray a blessing on them. We pray that you would raise up godly men and women with a biblical worldview in this domain. Writers, producers, broadcasters, journalists, or in, in the whole of this media domain, Lord, on the internet, uh, technology. And we thank you, Lord God, that you will give them skill. You will help them to be diligent. You will help them to equip themselves, Lord, and to be excellent at what they do. We pray a blessing on our media, Lord God. We ask that it would be characterized by wisdom and skill and integrity, Lord. We pray that truth and beauty may be the hallmarks of our media. Father, we pray for a hunger for truth in this domain, a hunger for truth in all of us who, who, who consume media, Lord God, a desire to seek out truth and expose the Exceptions. Father, we pray for protection for those already involved in this industry, Lord. We pray that you would be the wall of fire around them and the glory in their midst. May you keep them, Lord God. May you help them to be shining lights. May you help them to speak your word and to walk with integrity. We pray for protection over their marriages and families, Lord God. We pray for them for divine connection and contacts, for divine strategies, for creativity from on high, Lord, and wisdom for and high. We ask, Lord God, that the media in this nation would not be manipulated for personal gain or hidden agendas. Rather, Lord God, we ask that it would be used to hold to account those in influential positions. And we pray you would use it, Lord, to expose wickedness and corruption in high places, to bring to account those who need to be held to account. Father, we ask that you would raise up godly men and women in this domain who will champion the cause for the powerless, who would be a voice for the voiceless who would seek the truth and reveal it Lord God we pray for ourselves and our community to be wise consumers of information and opinion father we ask that you would bless the relationship between the church and the media between church and those involved in media we pray for truth and for morality to be presented Lord in Jesus name we pray amen and amen okay so that is media Media, presenting truth that we can make informed decisions. We need to pray for our media. The second um, part of this domain that I'm wanting to look at is arts, entertainment, and sports. Arts, entertainment, and sports. And guess what? God is interested in arts, entertainment, and sport. Hallelujah. For those who are religious and don't believe that, I've got news for you. That is not the case. Our God enjoys beauty. He enjoys refreshment. He enjoys edification. He enjoys competition. And uh, he likes to use these things to ed educate us. Okay. He is good. So William Blake said, This life's dim windows of the soul distort the heavens from pole to pole and goad you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. This life's dim windows of the soul distort the heavens from pole to pole and goad you to believe a lie when you see with and not through the eye. When we're seeing with and not through. Rav Ravi Zacharias explains it like this. He says, we were created to see through the eye with the conscience. Modern capacity is inviting us to see with the eye, devoid of conscience. So God always, this domain in particular, we need to see with the eye, through the eye with our conscience. Our conscience needs to be sharpened. C.S. Lewis um, said this. He said, I was standing today in the dark tool shed I think it was C.S. Lewis. 
I'll get back to you on that. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, I haven't actually written it yet. I think, I think it was, anyway. Um, I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside, and through the crack at the top of the door, there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing things with the beam. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes and instantly the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside and beyond that, 90 odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different experiences. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different experiences. It's the same thing that's being said. We have to see, in, especially in this particular domain, we have to see with our conscience through our eyes. This is, and this is really, this really shook me when I first read it. Ravi Zacharias said this, young people, how many of us are young here? Come on, everybody, everybody's young. <laughs> Young people, please hear me. This, to me, is the problem of the 20th century man. He no longer knows what to laugh at, and he no longer knows what to weep at. So you turn on your television screen, and before you know it, you're looking at a seduction yourself, and instead of weeping at it, you're watching in intrigue as the story unfolds. You watch illegitimacies transpire before your eyes and mine. And because Hollywood has convinced us that it is entertainment, we become entertained rather than sitting there with a crushed heart, a broken heart, and a contrite spirit. Isn't that true? We watch illegitimacies, adulteries on TV, and, and Hollywood so catches up our emotions that we almost, we, we want the woman to have the affair because our emotions are caught up. And what are we wanting? What are we wanting? We watch illegitimacies transpire before our eyes because Hollywood has convinced us it's entertainment. And I often wonder, this is Ravi speaking, I often wonder if my Lord Jesus were able to stalk some of the seats of Broadway or sit in some of the theaters where things are perpetrated and shown to you and me, where jokes are made of his virgin birth, where Christianity is demeaned and mocked, where illegitimacies are glorified and exalted. That which is vulgar is intended to make us laugh. That which is sacred is intended to make us weep. Rather than sit there in awe and gratitude for the sacred, what has really happened between the education system and whatever is whatever else is happening we've lost the differentiation between laughter and tears it is vitally important what you laugh at it is vitally important what you weep at what breaks your heart tells God who you are what makes you laugh tells God who you are what is he saying? He's saying when we watch these things, we're not watching them with our conscience. We're watching them with our eyes and our flesh. And we end up desiring things that are illegitimacies and should break our hearts. Amen. And our consciences get seared. And the values of a nation are formed by these things that we see on TV. And we're not using our consciences. And our consciences and the truth are so important in entertainment. Andrew Fletcher, Scottish political activist, from 1655 to 1716, he said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. Let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. Very true, very powerful. I hear some of the words that my kids are listening to, and you know, they pick it up from the songs and I'm thinking, Ish Lord, this one is really borderline. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is this okay? We have to really be careful because before you know it, they're singing along and you're listening to the words and you're like, no, 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 this is not godly. Amen. <laughs> so, in a speech at the USC Entertainment Law Symposium in 1988, British film producer Baron Putnam, who, who um, was involved in Chariots of Fire, Killing Fields, and The, mis and the Mission, he re reminisced about his own childhood growing up in the UK, but watching American movies. And this is what he said. Movies are powerful. Good or bad, they tinker around inside your brain. They steal up on you in the darkness of the cinema to form or confirm social attitudes. To an almost alarming degree, our political and emotional responses rest for their health in the quality and integrity of the present and future generation of film and television creators. Wow. 
I remain entirely convinced of the law of cause and effect. I also firmly suggest that the images of the filmmaker are responsible, frighteningly responsible, for the attitudes and behavior of the young and overly impressionable. Whether Christian viewers realize it or not, Hollywood will always influence and shape the values and culture of a generation that is, an impress that is impressionable. And who is most impressionable? Our children, our teenagers. We have to be so careful what we allow them to watch. And we need Christian excellence in this domain. Good Christian movies, good Christian entertainment. So David Frost, an English journalist and media personality who's, who's late, once humorously but perceptively remarked, television is an invention that permits you to be entertained in your living room by people you wouldn't have in your house. <laughs> That's true. We watch things and we entertain things that we would never entertain with other people in our house, in our own living room. Okay. Sure, you can see a play in theater on Broadway, turn on the TV to watch a movie or cartoon, listen to music, and you will find, without a doubt, a certain philosophy of life is being endorsed, exposed, or questioned. It will be there. If you go and turn on cartoons which your kids watch, watch carefully, listen carefully, there'll be a worldview there. Your kids are being indoctrinated. My kids are being indoctrinated, whether we are aware of it or not, by what they watch, what we allow them to watch on TV. The arts is the context within which many and many of the next generation are grappling with philosophy, worldviews, and understanding life. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 19 to 22, this is what it says. Now write this song for yourselves and teach it to your children. Put it in their mouths that it may be a witness against the children of Israel. So when I've brought them into their promised land and they've eaten and filled themselves and grown fat and turned to other gods and provoke me and break my covenant, then it shall be that this song will testify against them for a witness. For I know the inclination of their behavior today. And Moses wrote this song and taught it to the children of Israel. Why did he do that in a song form? Because songs are catchy. Because we remember the words. Because they get into our spirits. Because our children will remember them. Amen. These things are powerful. So the name, nature, and attributes of God in terms of arts and entertainment is God is beautiful. God is holy. Holiness is beautiful. Therefore, arts, music, entertainment, it should be beautiful. It should be beautiful. Anything that is vulgar, that is any death, destruction, defilement, immorality, it's not part of God's person. That's not what this domain was meant for. We shouldn't allow ourselves to be entertained by that. It's not a godly thing to be entertained by. Okay? It's not godly art and entertainment. So if I go into... An art, a museum and I see art that is vulgar. Okay, that's not art that God would call art. Art is meant to be beautiful. And I'm not meaning that all art has to be Mary and Joseph with animals around them and baby Jesus. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying it must be beautiful. It must be edifying. Amen. It mustn't be vulgar and grotesque and you look at it and you feel defiled okay that is not what it's about 1 chronicles 6 16 verse 29 give unto the lord glory due his name bring an offering and come before him worship the lord in the beauty of holiness he's beautiful he's holy psalm 27 verse 4 one thing i've desired of the lord that i will seek that i may dwell in his house all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the lord and inquire in his temple he's beautiful God is creator. God is ultimate artist. That's how we can be creative. That's how we can be artists. In the beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is potter and poet. Okay? We see that but uh, in Isaiah 64 verse 8, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter and we are the work of your hand. We see in Psalms that God is a poet. So God is all of these things and we are made in his image. So, of course, there will be those of us who want to be artists, who want to be poets, who want to be all these things. And I hope that parents will allow and celebrate their kids' um, giftings and desires. Okay? Now, I just put a little note here this morning because I was chatting to my husband about this. And I think it's important that we understand this, that God has a multifaceted or polypoikolos dimension of wisdom. And so art in Africa, he made a difference to art in America. And music in Africa 
is different to music elsewhere. And that's how God intended it. And every nation has a redemptive purpose. And so I was laughing with Pastor Vim because we traveled down to Natal a couple of weekends ago. We traveled together and we were listening to worship music that has a prayerful sort of um, spirit underneath it so we could pray along. And we were, and all the way down, we were listening to this music and praying and everything. And I said to her at the end, I said, Vim, um, can I tell you, can I, can I make a comment, an observation? She's like, yeah. I said, do you realize that all the artists that we listened to were black African men from the African continent? And she's like, oh, wow. We didn't intend it to be that way, but what is that all about? There's something on this continent, on the worship. There's something redemptive. There's something warfareish that God has given to Africa. And it's part of arts as well, and we have to embrace it and be who God created us to be on the African continent and not try and mimic other nations over there because that's not where the power is. The power is when we embrace who we are and we express God who we are. Amen. It's so important. What is beautiful? Something about art and music from the African continent Continent that is beautiful. It's a, it's a redemptive thing that God has given us and we need to celebrate it. Okay. Jesus was carpentered. So God has all of these things in his character and we meant to express this and be who God has made us to be in his image. In terms of sports, some of you might say, yeah, well, what does God have to do with sports? Well, you know, if we look at the qualities that God exhibits, the qualities that we learn in sport, that our children learn in sports, so God perseveres. So God is long-suffering. God is purposeful. God is victorious in battle and warfare is the ultimate competition. Amen? Amen. Okay, and he, he is patient and kind in the midst of competition. Jesus competed against Satan in the wilderness and defeated Satan with the word of the Lord in Matthew 4 verse 1 to 11. Jesus went to the cross to do battle against the fix of sin and death and he won. That is competition. 1 Corinthians 15 25 to 26 says, He must reign, that's Jesus, till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So God is competitive, and God is victorious, and God wins, okay? And I'm not saying that we have to win at all costs or anything like that. I'm just saying that we can emulate God. As believers, we are told to be more than conquerors in Christ, in Romans 8. We are told to tear down strongholds, 2 Corinthians. We're told to fight the good fight, 1 Timothy. We are told to put on the armor of God, Ephesians 6. These are just a few verses that show us that we are in competition with the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. And some of the, so these are important. So sport is good. It teaches us a number of things. And I'm going to go deeper into that just now. And by the way, this is the final part of the domain. So those of you who are now sweating very heavily, it's okay. Okay, we'll, we'll be done soon. Okay, but I'm going to finish this. Okay. So some of the attributes to be manifested through this domain that we're talking about of arts, entertainment, and sport include beauty, uniqueness, restoration, joy, edification, comfort, and education. Okay? Because we learn through competition. Amen. Okay, so the purposes, like I said, provides rest, provides rest, relaxation, provides restoration of health to our body, mind, and soul. It provides for beauty, recreation, music, enjoyment. It's there to encourage, to edify, to exhort, and also to educate and teach. What a beautiful domain. Isn't God good that he will give us this domain? He cares for all, he cares about all these things. Okay. Johann uh, Sebastian Bach said the aim and final end of all music should be none other than the glory of God and the refreshment of the soul. Tendai Chitsike, pastor in Grahamstown, a good friend of ours, he said this, the church has shrunk God from the God over every area of life to the God of personal salvation. With this shrinking of God has come our diminished creativity, our limited imagination, and a superficial understanding of the role of arts in our world. Mm. A church leader, Chris Vinand, wrote, The demise of the arts in the hearts, minds, and lives of the church is surely an indicator that revival has been reduced to a charismatic experience and not the full embodiment of the faith as portrayed by the Reformation and its artistic voices. You know, if I look in the Bible, I find it so fascinating that the first mention of someone being spirit-filled, I don't know if you can think when you, uh, what you think about this, but the first mention of someone being spirit-filled that I see was a craftsman named Bezalel, not a prophet and not a teacher. 
And you see this in Exodus 31, verse uh, 1 to 5. The Lord says to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. To design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, bronze, cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Actually, as I'm saying this, I'm just thinking of you, Brother Juan. God, he's just so, he's so practical, just has a solution, very creative. If God has made you creative with your hands, if you're good with your hands, maybe this is a gift that God has given you. Maybe he anointed you for something like this. And the expositor's Bible commentary says this. He says, it says, all that is good and beautiful and wise in human art is the gift of God. Is it beautiful? Is it wise? Is it good? It's of God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father of lights in whom there's no shadow of changing. James Ken D. James Kennedy notes, Living in a post-Christian culture, we see the effects of man's rejection of God, even in art. Art reflects life. And if life to the artist is meaningless, so will art be meaningless. So when you look at a piece of art and it's meaningless and it's ugly, well, that gives you a reflection possibly of the artist's worldview. Amen. Fyodor Dostoevsky took this idea a step further and said, First art will imitate life, then life will imitate art, then life will find its very meaning from the arts. And I think that's where we're living today. Now, the, the power of the arts is, is seen in this example that I'm going to share from 2 Samuel 12. And it's an example that Tendai Tsitsike, actually, I first got it from him. And when I told him I was going to use it today, he said, ah, I think I would have got that from my wife. So wherever it's from, it's from the Bible. And it's an example of the power of the arts and how gods can use the arts. Because you know what? Not everyone's going to come and sit in church on a Sunday. Not everyone's going to listen to a message online. But this particular account records a king, King David, and he committed terrible acts. In actual fact, he was sort of at the pinnacle of his success, and he'd just fallen from grace, and he just slept with another man's wife, sent that man into the heat of the battle so that man would be killed to cover over his own sin because the woman he'd slept with was pregnant. You all are familiar with the story, I'm sure. And guess how God confronts David. Guess how he chose to do it? through story. He did it through the arts and he sends a prophet to speak to David, to King David. And the prophet, Nathan, and, and, and I mean it must have been terrifying for him because David was all powerful and could have sent the prophet to his death as well. But anyway, he goes, obeys God, and he goes and he tells a story to King David and he, and he tells him about this man who stole this lamb from this poor man and he tell, goes through a whole story that evokes David's emotions. And at the end of the story, David said, this man in the story must die this man must die and what does Nathan say to him this man is you so it's like the story that Nathan used painted a picture and grabbed King David's heart and the justice in him and then Nathan turned it around and said well actually that's you so David was able to get a better perspective of his own life and his own heart. And that is the power of the arts that we can harness for the kingdom. We can really speak into people's hearts through movies, through art, in ways that we can't speak through speaking like this. Amen. So we need people who will do that creatively. Um, the sad reality is that in the last century, arts have often been the forerunner to changing culture for the worse, not for the better. Movies, music, other media are powerful tools to influence generations, to transform, transform cultural norms and worldviews. Okay, and we need to utilize this. Apologist Ravi Zacharias comments on the current state of the arts and the current reality we face in our media-saturated culture. And he says, truth has been relegated to subjectivity. Beauty has been subjugated to the beholder. And as millions are idiotized night after night, a global commune has been constructed with the arts enjoying totalitarian rule. Isn't that the case? I look at my kids sometime and I think, Lord, are they being idiotized by this TV? You know? I really do. The problem, of course, is not with the medium of arts, but rather the predominant worldview and the content that is espoused on it and, and, in, and in modern art. Okay, So we need the Nathans to rise up and influence in this domain. Prophetic artists 
in all of these different avenues of this domain. We need sportsmen and sportswomen who will be shining lights and examples in spotlights across the world. We need art and entertainment to reflect the beauty and creativity of God and to bring refreshment and restoration on multiple levels rather than defilement and wrong ideology. Amen. Now, just quickly before I close, I'm wanting, because sport is part of this domain, some of the purposes of sport. Okay, the first one is competition. Competition is good. It teaches us valuable lessons, okay? It's common in today's society in some communities to try and eliminate competition. I don't know if any of you have been at schools or at some children's sporting organizations where they play games where no score is kept. Or they have galas, but they don't give first, second, or third. Okay. Now, maybe when the kids are very young, you know, you can kind of like let that go. But as they get older, please, people. Okay. Life is life. You have to learn that you train for something and you win sometimes and you lose sometimes and you deal with it and you learn how to deal with it. So you learn how to be a good winner and you learn how to be a good loser. And you learn that you can't always win in life, but you learn that there are goals and there are purposes and there are things that you have to train towards and you have to try hard towards and maybe you win or maybe you don't. Amen. Those are life lessons and our kids need to learn them. Okay. Um, even some Christians claim that competition is bad because the winner makes the the, uh, the winning the, the winner can make the loser feel bad because he's lost, and they sometimes use this verse: "Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves." Everyone should look out not for his own interests but the interests of others. Okay, now they're taking that too far, far too far. Okay, because Paul, if you look in 1 Corinthians, he uses competitions amongst runners. He uses boxing competitions to illustrate the importance of spiritual discipline in one's life. And competition is important. It's, it's unlikely the Holy Spirit would have inspired Paul to write these things if he didn't think that competition was good. Okay, now the most extreme form of competition, like I said earlier, is war. And in a battle, people are competing for domination. And the consequences are most severe because people die. And what is the ultimate competition that we're in on this earth? It's spiritual warfare. It's warfare over our own lives to fulfill our purpose. It's warfare to make sure that we share the gospel on other people so we bring other people with us. And that's, that's a competition. Our walk in the Lord is like a competition. We need discipline in order to fulfill it. Amen. Okay. Um, Revelations 19, 14 to 15 says, um, the armies of heaven were following Jesus, riding on white horses dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will ruin them, rule them with an iron scepter. Okay. So, while the Bible doesn't forbid competition, it does forbid the heart attitudes that so many have when they compete. We to do all things for God's glory. All things includes competitions, it includes winning, and even losing. We need to do it in the right manner. So what are some of the things that sport can be used by, number, used to do? Number one, entertainment. How many of you like going to watch or watching gymnastics on TV? It's beautiful. It's up, up building, so it's entertainment. What types of sport we watch, we, we can think when we watch them, does this glorify God or not? Okay, so cage fighting, that, that is a sport, right? Does it glorify God? No might defile you okay don't watch it dog fighting don't glorify god don't watch it don't be a part of it okay for example wrestling with all that trash talking no point okay doesn't glorify god you don't need to watch it don't need to be a part of that so watch sport that's up building okay be a part of sport that's up building participation in sport it's a form of recreational companionship my husband ran with me yesterday hallelujah <laughs> Okay, and God has given us all things for our enjoyment. Physical exercise is good for us. Say, it's good for me. Ooh, it's good for you. <laughs> I'll tell you it's good for you, okay? Getting children involved. You know, there's so much that children can learn from team sports and sports. So much. Teamwork, fruit of the spirit, okay? Submission to authority, obedience to rules, attitudes, like learning how to win and how to lose and how to deal with refs that are biased against you, and how to deal with teammates that don't pull their weight, working towards a goal, resilience, important lessons that our kids need to learn. We can't protect them from that. We have to allow them to face those things and help them to learn through them. God can use it to teach us many life lessons, perseverance, patience, commitment, running your own race. That's a big one. 
training, helping us with competitiveness, how to, how to behave generally, even in terms of spectatorship. You know, I've watched some of these spectators, like Pirates versus Chiefs, you know? Like, spec please, people, if you're a Christian, don't leave your Christian cap at the outside of the stadium and become a hooligan. Premier League soccer, you know? The spectator, some of the things they do. Yo. Okay? Even being a professional sportsman, it's important that these people who are godly and who are Christians, are, they excel and they're good role models. They use it to influence for the gospel, to be a light for Christ. You know, often the talent opens a door for the calling. So maybe they're professional sportsmen and God will use that to open a door to something else later on that God wants to use them in. Amen. And it's important that we pray for our sportsmen and women. You know, in high schools, I, I mean, I, I don't know. My kids are not in high school and they don't do rugby in high school. So some of you might, might already know this. But the kids use steroids in high school. They cheat. Okay? People have become obsessed with sport. Doping. Okay? It's not great. We need, you know, for example, I've got your Eric Liddell. Such an example. You know, God... Um, blessed him and made him really, really fast. And in, in 1924, in the Summer Olympics, he, he ran and he did well. And Liddell, he said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Isn't that beautiful? When I run, I feel his pleasure. And he went off to China as a missionary after competing in those Olympics. So competition in sport is good. And healthy competition is good. Unhealthy competition and attitudes are what is not good. So all of these things God has given us for our benefit, for our enjoyment, for our refreshment, to educate, to teach us. And I'm going to pray as we complete and as I land this, this message. I'm going to pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we lift up all of those involved in sports and in entertainment, Lord God. We pray for those who are Christians involved in these areas. Lord, even sound engineers, Lord, even, even musicians who operate in church but also in the world. Father, we, we pray for all of your people. We pray for a strengthening in the inner man with your Holy Spirit. We pray for integrity. We pray you would give them a wisdom in knowing who to, who to partner with, Lord God, what, what to accept and what not to accept. We pray you would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We pray you would use them as an influence. Lord, we pray for our professional sports people and our elite athletes. We ask, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom as they, as they walk their daily lives, as they live their lives. We pray for protection over them, Lord God, over their purity, over their marriages and their families. We pray that you would raise up more godly men and women in these domains to influence for you, Lord God. We pray you would raise up influential actors and singers, influential sportsmen and artists who will stand for you, Lord God. We pray that you would raise up producers who recognize the need for family-friendly entertainment. We pray for just a flood of Christian entertainment that the world will be attracted to, Lord. Non Non-believers will even be attracted to, that it will be excellent, Lord. The standard would be high, but it will espouse godly values, Lord God. It would espouse and, and put forward a biblical worldview. We pray for the success of godly entertainment and art that esteems godly values and principles. We pray that you would draw influential people to yourself, that they will become ambassadors for Christ. Father, we pray today for creativity and diligence and excellence that reflects your character in your men and women in this domain. We ask for a spirit of integrity and humility and excellence on these people, and uh, entertainers and sportsmen and women, Lord God. We ask for open doors, for larger platforms, for great greater influence for your men and women involved in these arenas. We pray for their character to be able to contain the spotlight, to be able to contain the attention and the pressure and all the temptations that come with it, Lord. We pray for laborers to speak to those in the media and arts and sporting circles about the love of God. We pray for believers in these industries to take every opportunity to use their talents, to share your values and principles with their fans and audience. And we thank you, Lord God, 
that in our church, you're raising up a prayerful people who will pray with intelligence, who will pray with your mind, who will pray with a biblical worldview, who will pray in accordance with your heart. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out that spirit of grace and supplication in our midst, and you would do it, Lord. Do a new thing in our midst. May it be easy for us to pray. May it be easy for us to carry the burden of the Lord. Now just with every, as your eyes are closed, as your head is bowed, I just would like you to slip up your hands. I've got two, two areas I want to pray for. If you are called to the domain that I've looked at today, if you believe you're called to this in one way or another, and you want to just make a commitment to stand up and ask God to use you more, and you want to make a commitment to pray for yourself and others in this domain, I want you to slip your hand up. Is there anyone here? Yeah, okay. And those who want to, to commit themselves to pray more for the domains in general, you want to make a commitment before God. You say, you know what, Lord, every week I'm going to pray for a domain or I'm going to pray for two. Or If you want to make a commitment before God to pray for the domains, can you just slip up your hand? I would like to see. And God, you, you're making the commitment before God, right? It's before God. Come on, people, it's important that we pray for the domains. Jesus wants his kingdom to come in all areas of life. And he, he wants us to um, to pray more and, and effect change. So I'd like to see more hands. Come on, who's going to pray for the domains? I want to see more hands. Who will, who will commit? Okay, once a month even, but it's God's heart. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pray for you all. Father, you can put your hands down. Father, I pray first of all for those who are already involved in this domain. I thank you for them. I just speak an increased creativity and increased wisdom. Thank you, Lord, that you go before them and you make crooked places straight. You open doors. You make a way, Lord, even those who are currently looking for employment and more work. Father, I thank you that you provide that for them. You provide platforms and opportunities. And you help them to shine, Lord God, and fulfill your purpose on their lives in this domain. And Lord, for the rest of us who are wanting to make a commitment to pray for these domains, Lord, in accordance with your word, in accordance with your will. Lord, you saw us raise our hands. We want to pray. We want to be used by you. Lord, I believe that the greatest calling that we have on this earth is to be a prayer, a prayer and an intercessor. That is the greatest calling. That is, no one sees that. That is in secret. And Lord, we want to be those. And, 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 and in that place, we get to hear your heartbeat. We get to hear what you're saying to the nations and concerning your will. And Lord, we want to be those who will lay down our lives and pray and affect change on this earth for our children and the generations to come. And Lord, those of us who raised our hands, we ask for a supernatural grace to do it. Would you pour out a spirit of grace and supplication on us, we pray in Jesus' name.